your precious blood. everyone welcome thank you for joining us online here this morning uh, been a heavy week hope that you all feel uh, the love from our online service hope that you all are able to stay as connected 
as possible with those uh, around you. Nothing new as far as announcements go this week, but I'm gonna go over them anyway. Um, if you are watching the sermons and would like a sermon study guide, and a lot of the house churches are doing this, the sermon study guides have been added to the sermon visuals page. Um, if you follow us on Facebook, we are Watermark Tampa Church. Uh, if you need anything, we would really like to hear from you, want to stay connected in some sort of way that you're not currently able to, please email us at governingboard at watermarktampa.com. And if you're in need of prayer, please email prayer at watermarktampa.com and our prayer team will reach out to you. Um, there's a lot of We Watermark content online, and you can get that at watermarktampa.com. Uh, if you have children, make sure you look into those resources. And giving can be done at watermarktampa.com slash give. Uh, that's for online giving for our church, our staff. Um, also, the recurring events that we have, we still have Bible for lunch every other Tuesday. Uh, every other Tuesday, Tommy will talk about a different aspect of the Bible from how it was written to different literary devices used. That's every other Tuesday for 45 minutes on Zoom at noon. And then the opposite every other Thursday, church history for lunch. Tommy's talking about, or other, we've had guests maybe on both of them, talking about events or figures in early church history, mostly from the first six centuries. So every other Thursday, the opposite to the every other Tuesdays uh, at noon on Zoom. There's 45 minutes and then there's Q&A time afterwards. We also are still doing a call to prayer every other Wednesday at 8 p.m. So you can join that call, join our prayer team, join other members in our congregation in prayer for our community, our country, our world, our church. Um, and just as a reminder, again, if you'd like to reach out to us at governing board at watermarktampa.com, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. And I hope you have a good rest of your day. Kids, we only have eight days left until our first ever virtual VBS. If you are not registered, I want you to stop what you're doing right now and kindly go ask your mom and dad to sign you up. You'll be able to watch VBS every day at whatever time works for you from your computer. We are also making kits for you to do activities at home. There are a lot of fun surprises in store. There's going to be slime. That's all I'm gonna say, that's all I'm gonna say. You need to register, watermarktampa.com slash VBS. Hello, good morning, Watermark. Good to see you all. Glad you're here. I'm starting to feel like a podcaster. Um, today, we are uh, in Acts chapter 8. Um, an amazing passage for exactly what, we're, what our country, our world is going through right now. Um, uh, fair warning, some of this will be hard to talk about, but we're going to do it anyways. We're a church. We're the presence of Christ in this world, and this is what we do. Um, so today we're in Acts chapter 8. We're going to start at uh, verse 26. I'm going to open us up a word of prayer, and uh, I'm just going to take this a little bit at a time. I'm not going to read the whole passage right up front, all right? Take some time this week to read it on your own as well. Let's pray. Father, be with me now as I uh, virtually try to join my brothers and sisters as we are scattered around, but, but we attempt to be one people with one mind saying one thing together to this world, and that thing is you, that message is Jesus, um, that the way of Christ is the right way, and the path of Christ is the right way, to healing, to salvation, to all of it. I pray right now that you would show us something new, something we haven't seen. Um, wake us up to what you're doing around us. Help us to take part in it. Make us uh, not afraid of it, but excited about it. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, Acts 8. Starting in verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, Philip has been in Samaria. Uh, remember, a lot of these Christians are running because they're pers there's persecution. And while they are running, they're planting churches and they're talking to people about Jesus. Now, um, Philip is told to leave Samaria, but he's not told where to go. 
uh, and he's not told to go to another populated area where he can plant another church, where he can talk to people about Jesus. Something entirely different is happening here. Um, he's told to go somewhere where there are, in fact, no people. It's just a desert road. And um, he's honestly told to go at an odd time, noon, the middle of the day. Uh, th that's what the Greek is sort of hinting off at by the word used for um, the description of, of where to go and, and, uh, and when. Um, so it's an unusual time of day. Noon is a, is a hard time to travel in the desert. It's a deadly time to travel in the desert. Um, and so it's relatively dangerous for him to go out there at this point in time, especially when nobody else is there, nobody to grant him hospitality that he needs. Um, and so I want us to try to picture him and get into the mindset with which he is, is doing this, with which he's following the spirit. Remember, He's mimicking Acts, uh, I'm sorry, Luke, the author of Luke and Acts, has, he depicts these disciples as mimicking how Jesus was led. Jesus was led by the Spirit. He wasn't led by a text. He was led by the Spirit of God there. And the Spirit even drove him to reinterpret the text oftentimes um, in light of what the Spirit was revealing to him. We are oftentimes uncomfort uncomfortable with this because we are children of the Enlightenment. We want things laid out for us to see. But the Spirit doesn't do that. Literally, the Spirit moves from the text to the heart and guides the people. So the Spirit of God comes to Philip and says, I want you to go here to this desert road in the middle of the day, and I want you to do it now. Um, and so he does. Uh, so get into his mindset. You don't know where you're going, but you're going somewhere. Um, you, you know that it's, it's where you're apparently supposed to be, but you don't know why, and so you go. And I'd imagine that you would be walking there sort of looking around like, okay, I was told to go here. And it's sort of like you've been giving like this quest and like go to the center of town and this. And, that. and so he goes to this desert road and he's standing there and he's looking around and he's walking and he's traveling and he's just looking around like, I don't know why I'm here, but apparently there's something here for me. And so I will keep my eyes open and my ear to the ground and I will listen for what God is doing here now. And I will find it and I will be a part of it. So he's sent there to find out what God is doing, to simply observe and pay attention and join in, okay? Um, so then we get to verse 27. He starts to realize the passage opens up. Acts 8, 27 through 29. It says this. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. And the spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. Okay. So he gets there and he sees this interesting person that he's not, the kind of person he's not used to seeing there. Um, and he's like, okay, I think we're here. And the spirit of God tells him, go to that chariot and stay near. He didn't tell him what to do. Just hang out over there. Like he's, he's literally just listening and like, okay, yeah. Over, okay. Yeah. This feels, yeah, this feels right. It's a really interesting way for God to like sort of lead his people and, and, Forgot to do his work. Um, so he sees this man in the chariot and he goes uh, and, he, and, he, and he gets his next command while he's at the chariot. And so he's, he says, okay. And he starts following behind it. He's staying near it. The chariot's moving and he's following behind the chariot, staying near it. Probably not, probably trying to not appear creepy, um, which is probably hard to do when there's not many people on the road. Um, and he's still not sure what's happening. So let's look at verse 30 and 31 of Acts 8. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, and he heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked him. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Okay. It is obvious now that God is chasing after this guy. Whoever this guy is, God is chasing him. Uh, God sees this person on the road and has singled him out for some purpose. We don't know what it is. Philip doesn't know what it is, but God has chosen this man and has singled him out and is pursuing him and using his people to do this. Uh, he has gone so far as to send one of his own apostles into the middle of the desert at noon, the hottest part of the day, to chase after this chariot, like, a, like some kind of heat-seeking missile. God's like, I'm, I'm locked onto this guy. I'm gonna send one of my people over there, okay? Now, why? Who is this guy? So I want to, I want to, from what we can, I want, I want to open up what we can see from the text. Okay. You can tell a lot 
uh, from a description um, given by the apostles, the writers of the text. You, if you look at the description and then you look up these things, like what was going on in those days, you can gather a lot of information about a person. Okay. So let's do this. Let's do some scholarship. Let's open this all up. So um, he is called, how does he say it? Um, he sa it says he's an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake. Now, um, Kandake uh, was the queen. She was a person. Kandake was, a, was the queen of a place called uh, Meros, Nubia. Um, it was a, a black African kingdom between two places called Aswan and Khartoum, okay? Um, and Mero, the place where Kandake was the queen of, Mero was the capital of that general area where um, this Ethiopian eunuch was from. He worked for the queen. It was the capital city of all the areas around it that I've just mentioned. Um, she was very powerful. Uh, this kingdom was established around 760 BC, and it was well known by the Romans. The Romans knew of this place, and they were fascinated by it. You can read ancient writings about it. Um, Nero is known to have gone there. Um, the people were fascinated by the people who lived there and the, the altogether different way that they lived from the Romans, okay? Um, a lot of them were infatuated with these people whom they had heard tales about. Um, one of the writings I read this week by o Odysseus said that he, that, that he knew a man from this region and that this man was the most handsome man that he had ever seen in his life, okay? Um, and he describes him as, as woolly hair, dark black skin. He describes him as just incredibly handsome. Um, and amongst other things, they were inventors of astrology. So um, the Magi at the beginning of Matthew um, were either from this area or they learned astrology from these people. Um, lots of people in the, in the text are sort of in the scriptures are coming into contact with people who are followers of astrology, students of astrology. That would have been invented by these people um, that were ruled by Queen Kandake. Um, and so Luke's audience would have known in their mind what this man looked like. They would have assumed, they would have assumed that he was black. Um, and we have writings that suggest to no surprise whatsoever, okay, this is not going to surprise anyone, but we have ancient writings from this day that suggest that the light-skinned rulers of the ancient world treated the dark-skinned people worse than they treated the white-skinned people. This is not a new invention in human history. Um, we have a letter from Queen Kandake herself of Miro, the, the woman who this man worked for, the treasury, her treasurer, okay, uh, the man who, I'm sorry, this man was her treasurer. We have a letter from Queen Kandake of Miro uh, to uh, Alexander the Great, where she explicitly says, him, she says to him, she says, she asks him not to think the worse of us for the color of our skin. We are purer in soul than the whitest of your people, she says, okay? Um, and I, I'm putting the reference here too, where you can read more of this. Um, racism is not new, it's not. Uh, white people looking down on black people, not new. All through the text as well. Um, all through ancient writings. Um, and the scriptures address it, okay? Um, so, Let's keep going with who this guy was. Not only that, not only was he, was he um, black and from this place uh, and, and ruled by Queen Kandake. Um, not only that, Luke tells us that this man was a eunuch, okay? Now, uh, a eunuch, the, the word here, it basically, it can mean several things, but it basically is saying that, that he is neither fully male nor fully female in the eyes of his day. Um, he's lacking sexual reproductive organs. Uh, and this is likely something that, uh, chances are this is something that was done to him as a child. Um, it's possible that he was born this way um, and thus entered into the queen's service, but it's far more likely that this was done to him as a young child, as a baby, that he was chosen um, and he was chosen by someone more powerful than himself, that he was mutilated, that he was basically customized, custom made to better serve the position that his powerful people had chosen him for, okay? Um, 
And so he was basically taken as a child and customized to serve in specific ways, to be a tool. In those days, he basically, he was, an, he was the ultimate slave. Um, he, was, he was built to be taken advantage of by powerful people, um, even sexually, but, but he was built never to actually experience any pleasure himself, if you understand what I'm saying. Um, he was simply a body for use, a tool, never fully human. Um, he could never be referred to as a man. He would always be referred to as a boy in the eyes of the world in that day. He could never own land. He could never have a voice in politics, in, in the lands in which he lived. Um, those are things that came with manhood, with growing older. And manhood was given basically to those who were of age and able to reproduce sexually. So this, this, this man, who I will call him a man, he, he was not considered one by anyone around him. Um, no matter how old people like him grew, they were never given true manhood. They were always considered boys. Let's pause here for a second because I want to point out something, by the way. Um, a lot of American slavery in our history was modeled on first century Roman slavery, was modeled on the slavery of the first century in that day, especially prominent in the Roman Empire. Um, this is why white men throughout our history as Americans have referred to black men as boy. This is where this comes from. Um, because even at the founding of our country, when only men could vote, um, a black man was never considered a man. Uh, even as an old man, a black man was denied manhood and was always called a boy. Because if you call him a man, then he can own land. He can have a family which is his, which he cannot be pulled away from, which cannot be taken from him. He can have a voice and a vote in an equal spot in society. So as long as we call them boy, they were never really one of us. Um, so if you've ever wondered, by the way, this is a pastoral advice, if you will, if you've ever wondered why it is so racist to call a black man boy, now you know, and you will never make that mistake again. Um, uh, this, this stuff has been around a long time. Um, let's go a little farther. Let's, let's get back into like sort of who this guy was. It also says, Luke tells us that he has gone to Jerusalem to worship. That means he was a Jewish convert. This is a huge concept here for this man to be a Jewish con, uh, convert. As he has theological implications, it has social implications. Uh, it means that God has drawn him in despite the place that he lives, despite the life that he was forced to live. He wanted to be one of God's people. Somehow he came to faith in Yahweh and in the covenant God made with Israel, whom he is not even a part of. And he wanted to be one of God's people. He wanted to be equal with them. And Luke tells us that he is reading a copy of the book of the prophet Isaiah. This would have been purchased, no doubt, at great cost to himself. People did not have passages of scripture back then. This man must have bought this for an incredible amount of money. A lot of synagogues in the ancient world didn't have full canons of, of the scriptures of their day. A lot of them were lucky to have one or two scrolls of various texts. Um, only the wealthier ones would because of great benefactors would purchase them and give them to them. Um, very few people in the ancient world would have had access to what this man is holding. Uh, a lot of towns were luckily, lucky to, to ever possess one or two copies. Um, and lastly, the thing that we can see is that he's heading back from the temple. So he has embarked on a pilgrimage to the temple and is heading back home. He's come from his homeland to go to the temple. This is a spiritual pilgrimage for him. Maybe this was the only time he ever did this. Maybe he did this every year. We don't know. It is highly unlikely that his pilgrimage would have actually ended well, though. And here's how we know this. Like, he, he would have gone there and not been allowed in. Here's how we know. He was not Jewish by blood, so he would have been kept out of the inner courts. Not only that, um, there's passages like Deuteronomy 23.1. Um, which says, uh, let no one who has been emasculated by cutting or crushing enter into the assembly to worship. And there's different versions of this that will say, describe the same thing in different ways. Um, that if a, man, if a man's reproductive organs have been cut off or damaged in any way, he was not allowed into the temple. 
um, he was not allowed to worship with the people. Okay. That, that is one of the descriptions that we are given uh, for various reasons. I, I don't have time to go into all that this morning. Um, and so what I'm saying is basically this man would have traveled from Roman, traveled into Roman territory from his homeland a very long ways, where as a, as a black Jewish convert, he would have been treated as an outcast. He would have spent a lot of money to make this trip. He spent a lot of money on this text. And he apparently has done this all by himself. He's alone. And he gets there and he would have been rejected by God's people and not been allowed into the assembly. And so now we find him after this whole episode traveling back alone while studying the text. His hope is still with him that he can be included, that he can be seen as equal. His hope is still with him and he's, he's in the chariot and he's writing and he's reading the text. And here's the thing. No one should be left alone with the text. That's not how the text works. The text is meant to be read communally. It is meant to be performed out loud with your body, not just read. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so here is the part where we see that God has singled this man out. And now with a lot more background, maybe we can possibly begin to see why. This man is hopeful and he is devoted. And he wants to be an equal with his brothers and sisters of Yahweh. And God has singled him out for Philip to be sent to because God will not allow him to be alone with the text. God sees someone like this alone with the text and refuses to leave him like that. God intends to actually, if there is no one there to read it with him, God himself will join this man and perform the text. If there is no one there to perform the text, God will perform the text. There is no community to perform it, to be God's theatrical performance. And so what we see here is this man is reading Isaiah 53, and what he is reading, God enters in to perform it with him. And you will see this, and it is amazing, all right? Um, let's read some of this. Um, Isaiah 53, let's read verse 7 through 8. This is the text that he was reading. This is the passage he's reading. It says this. This is the passage of Scripture that the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers, it is, is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. So, what passage is this man reading? In this passage, Isaiah captures the image of a body in disgrace and in pain. And Isaiah is describing this. Isaiah speaks of somebody who is not moving freely, who is not allowed to move freely, but instead is led, okay? With no choice on his destination, like a lamb being led to his own death, slaughter, and can do nothing about it, okay? No choice on, on when he lives or dies. Uh, Isaiah is also speaking of someone who has no voice of his own and who is owned by someone else, and so he keeps silent. Even though he has desires, even though there are things that he would like to say, he has no voice in the world. Isaiah also speaks of someone who has experienced no justice, someone whose body was cut and abused for the sole benefit of the one doing the cutting and abusing, okay? A man who is suffering for the benefit of another man. Isaiah also speaks of someone who has no descendants and who will never have descendants. Uh, Isaiah is also speaking of someone whose life was eventually taken. And I want you to ponder, being this man, the Ethiopian eunuch, reading this, what are you reading? You're reading a description of yourself. I mean, have you ever read a book and then suddenly you're reading this book and suddenly you realize that you and the author are kindred spirits? That somehow you and the author have been through the same things and are familiar with the exact same experiences? I have. Um, that somehow you both understand something that most people don't understand. But you do, and suddenly you find a, you're reading a text and the author does. That's where we find ourselves here with this Ethiopian eunuch, okay? Isaiah could be describing this own man's experience, his own experience. This man has experienced all of these things, and he has 
no hope that any of it will change. And yet he also takes pilgrimages to the temple in full knowledge that there is no hope that he will ever be accepted. But maybe there's, maybe there's an, an atom sized kernel of hope inside of him. Maybe there is. And so he still seeks. And so he still seeks God, the one who he has heard about, who frees oppressed peoples. There's a, a Jewish philosopher named uh, uh, Abraham uh, Joshua Heschel. And he, uh, he's a Jewish scholar, philosopher, and he wrote this book of Jewish philosophy called God in Search of Man. And in that book, he says this. Here's what he says. He says, if a man says to you, I have, not, I have labored and not found, do not believe him. And if he says, I have not labored, but still have found, do not believe him. If he says, I have labored and have found, you may believe him. It is true that in seeking him, we are assisted by him. Okay. He says, when we seek God, we are assisted in the seeking. It is a joint effort. Um, this man continues to seek God. And suddenly he finds himself in God's story. But not just in the text that he's reading. But suddenly, this text that he is reading, that he sees himself in, suddenly it becomes real life. Um, let's read now Acts 8, 30 and 31. It says this. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you were reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. And so, so he invited Philip to come and sit with him. And so now a miracle is about to happen, okay? Because all this man sees when he reads this story is, is a body of pain and shame, but he's about to see something different. Look at verse 34 and 35. The, the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please. Who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? And Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. First off, real quick, why is this man asking this question? Because the story seems to be about himself. And so he has a genuine question about what Isaiah is talking about. Who is this? Who's he talking about? Is he talking about me? Is he talking about himself? Is there someone else that has experienced this as well? Who's that person? I want to find them. I want to find their writings. So picture this. This man goes to Jerusalem in his brokenness and shame because of his race and his status. And he goes there to find God. And he finds nothing. But now, on his way back, he actually finds God in his shame and in his brokenness. You see what I'm saying? He went there in shame and brokenness to find God. And on the way back, he finds God in his shame and brokenness. Do you see what is happening? It's brilliant. God is, is bearing what he has borne his entire life. He's now hearing from Philip about the story of Jesus, someone who knows exactly what he has been through. And God is, he finds out that God has himself borne exactly what this man has borne his entire life, he thought he was reading his own story, but the story that he was actually reading was the story of God. And God transforms this man's life story into God's own story. The man who thought that he was covered in shame and misery now finds that he's covered in the story of Christ. Welcome to the New Testament. It's amazing. Um, <clears throat> now, God has come for this oppressed and suffering black man. That's who God has come for in this story. Oftentimes, you will hear this passage read, and you will hear preachers speak from, speaking from a position of privilege and power in this world, like myself. You will hear them talk about the passage in this way. They will say, do you know why God chose this man? God chose this man because this man was close to power. He was close to the queen. And God himself wanted to get a hold of powerful people. And so God chose this man so that God could save the powerful people. And then if God will do the thing through the powerful people, it will trickle down to the rest of everyone else. I want to be clear. When we read the Bible this way, 
we are doing the same thing that the queen and the oppressors did to this man. We are doing the same things that American slave owners did to people. When we read the Bible this way, when we read about this passage in this way, we are once again making this man a tool, an instrument of evangelization and mission to other places and other people. We are making this man a tool to assist other people, okay? And we are taking the focus off of what is actually happening here, is that God has come for this man precisely in his difference, precisely in the complexities of his life. He is being brought close because his life matters to God. This is not about the queen. This man, his life matters to God. His black life matters to to no one else in the world but God. And now it matters to the church because God has sent his body there. Are you catching what is happening here? God is not choosing somebody to use as a tool. He's choosing someone as a child, an equal. He's choosing someone to be his image and shedding his body of the image of the useful tool. No more of that. Imagine what it would have been like when he got just a few pages further in Isaiah 53, okay? And this is what would have happened. They would have sat and read the text. Um, Whenever you see people in the scriptures, in the New Testament especially, just referencing one passage, that is a Jewish, Jewish way of saying, the whole passage. It starts there. They didn't have chapters and numbers. Those, that's from the 15th century. Someone sat down and added chapters and titles and page separations, but they didn't do that. By quoting a passage, you're quoting the whole text, okay? And just a few pages later, later Philip and this black Ethiopian eunuch, here's what they would have read, okay? Pay attention here. Cause, and imagine being this man reading this. This is what the Lord says. Maintain justice and do what is right, for my salvation is close at hand and my righteousness will soon be revealed. Blessed is the one who does this. Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, the Lord will will surely exclude me from his people. And let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says to the eunuchs, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. That's talking about children, by the way, a family. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenants, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. The holy mountain, by the way, is the temple. I will bring them into my temple and give them joy in my house of prayer. Let's keep going. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The sovereign Lord declares, he who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them beside those, who, those already gathered. Do you see it? And when he, when he hears what he's reading, he goes, hey, hey, I hope you understand what you're reading. And I hope you understand the weight of it because this is for you. Because what Isaiah is saying is that when God is done with his people, there will be justice and righteousness and no foreigners will be excluded. And the sexually abused outcasts, they will be brought in and made whole. Those who bear shame because they have no offspring, the barren, the sexual minorities, those who can't find or form a family, they will enter in and find sons and daughters, young ones who look to them for love and wisdom and guidance. They will find family and belonging. That is what Isaiah is saying. There will no more be outsiders. No longer. My house will be a house for all nations. The church. The church should gather the exiles. All those who don't feel that they have a place. The voiceless. The church should be on the front row gathering them together and listening and giving an ear to them. Do not let people read the text alone. And I mean that. And here's what I mean by that. We are not alone when we act out the text. Okay. 
we are the theatrical performance of the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We are a Christiform people. Okay? When we see people crying out for justice, they are speaking the Bible. And we do not let them speak it alone. We join them in it. And you know what? You know what I, what I count as a miracle this very day, this entire week, this week when there's protests in the streets and police brutality being exposed and the, the, the depraved hearts of human beings, even in the hearts of those taking advantage of people who are crying out for justice. The miracle that I see, what, just a, and it's just a, a small one. I don't want to make us the center of anything. But this is a small miracle that God has brought our journey as Watermark Church to this text on this week. We planned on going through Matthew and then Acts years ago. We spent three years in Matthew. We spent a few weeks off and then we went through Acts. No one sat down and said, hey, there's going to be some protests and Black Lives Matter movements uh, in the first week in June. And then when that happens, we'll speak on this text. No, 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 no. We've just been moving through the text. And so what I see, the miracles I see happening here is that God is joining us in our reading. Just like God joined this Ethiopian man on his, on his chariot reading the text, we gather, we are reading the text, and God joins us. And just like when God made it real life there in his day, God is now making it real life in our life as we read this text. God is now joining us in this text by acting this out in the world around us. He has always been present. And as we read this about an oppressed black man who has no place in society, who has been oppressed and used his entire existence, desiring equality and to be equal with God's people, God guides our, our footsteps and our reading to this text to this very day to open us up and read this to us. God is, Christ is before us. Christ is behind us. Christ is beneath us. Christ is above us. Christ is within us. And Christ is out there already working. And like Philip, we are being sent out into the streets. And, and what do you do when you get there? You don't know. You don't get to know ahead of time. But you go prayerfully and you listen with eyes of love, looking at the people around you and saying, what is God doing here? What am I looking for? And you take part in it. And that's all you can do. We are people led by the spirit. The spirit of God is present within us. There is no, there is no instructions written down for you. Go out be the presence of the body of Christ. This man was reading and God brought a Christian to, into his midst to perform the text he was reading. We are reading and God is bringing us into the text in our own day in order to perform it now. And so we must perform it. And you know what this message is? We, we always want to go to God to escape our shame and pain. But when we look close enough, we see God in it. We can see God in this moment. Christ in the common. By the way, that's what communion is. And that is my segue into communion. So if you have your elements, grab them. Communion is about seeing Christ in the common. It's just bread. It's just wine. You have these all the time. But for a few minutes, we look at these things and we see Christ in the common. Communion, that's where the word communion comes from. Common union. It is the union of God with common things. It is the Eucharist. It is the good gift to look at something that we so normally see, but now to see it in the divine in it. Like taking a walk in the street in a crowd full of people, something you've done a thousand times, but in this moment now, it becomes a divine thing because you are doing the work of Jesus there. And so this is an exercise, seeing Christ in the common. And this was meant to carry you forward into the streets to see Christ in the common and work for justice. Speak up for the unheard. The body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ poured out for you and for the world, for your healing, for your salvation. And it is also an invitation for you to allow your body to be broken and poured out for the healing of other people, the salvation of other people. Do this in remembrance of Christ.
Father, be with us in this time of winter. We look forward to the spring. Help us to take part in it. Let us plant now things that will grow in the future. Help us to be a theatrical performance of your life, your death, your burial, and your resurrection that brings all humanity, humanity back to life with us. In your name, amen. Let's end with our Kalak prayer, shall we? God, our rock who shepherds us through the desert, give us patience in the times that we feel lost. Remove our focus from what is gone and remind us of our blessings. Lift us up when we are down. Renew our hearts and minds with your word. Grant us the eyes to see to where your faith is calling us. Bolster our faith. Guide us to our purpose as we become one people, bringing your kingdom to earth. In the name of Jesus, amen. Grace and peace, Watermark. Have the greatest June of your entire life. <laughs>